What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Hilliard Guest, and you guys are listening to the Break It Down Show. So I want to give a big shout out to my big bros, John and Pete, out there doing big things. Congratulations on your thousandth freaking episode, man. That's huge, my guys, my dudes. You guys are out there killing it. Man, can't believe it. Um, just a couple of years ago, you guys are barely at 100. Big time, man, big time. Anyway, I celebrate you too. I salute you too into 2021. All the love, all the best. You know how we do it. At this time, with no further ado, I would like to introduce my other big bro, my homeboy, from another mother, <laughs> Jeffrey Reddick, big time writer, producer, director himself. You guys know him from creating um, the, the big franchise series, Final Destination. You guys have all seen it. You know what it is. He's out there creating a bunch of more new stuff that you guys are going to be checking out over the next few years for sure. So I want to introduce my man, Jeffrey Reddick, to the show. Again, this is Hilliard Guest. You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, at Hilliard Guest. You guys can follow my own podcast, Hilliard Guest's Screenwriter's Rant Room, also known as AKA The Rant Room, out there doing big things too. You know how we do it. Um, you guys can find us at Screenwriters RR on Twitter. Um, also, Screenwriters Rant Room, sorry, Screenwriters RR.com. And we got a lot of merch and all other cool stuff out there. And um, a lot of good things happen in the new year. Lots of new showrunners and guests we're going to be having on. It's going to be a crazy year coming out of a crazy year. <laughs> anyway, check me out out there. Lots of good shit going on. Um, thanks again to John and Pete for doing big things. Love you guys. Here we go. Take it away from here, guys. Again, congratulations on a thousandth. God, I can't even say the word. A thousandth show. <laughs> That's huge, my dudes. Anyway, take it away. Everybody, please enjoy this new episode with my mans. Um, you're going to enjoy this episode. It's going to be off the chain. And make sure you subscribe to their show. Make sure you follow them. Make sure you like and support the show. All right? The Break It Down Show. Peace. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Ames. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> This is Jeffrey Reddick, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show, with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, man, I was were just talking off mic. Uh, Jeffrey's back on the show, talking about his latest movie. And it's uh, interesting, you know, when we first met, we met at Hilliard's place in the lot, and we talked about, you know, just what you did and all of your adventure to get up to New Line and... You know, it's really remarkable. The time that you came up, you captured a moment where, like, you could really call information, right, and go, "Give yeah. me the phone number, <laughs> new line." As as like a high school kid or whatever, you know, precocious. And and then I love your story about writing that letter where you're like, "I took the time to write this thing. You damn well better read it, Mister." <laughs> and the guy's like, "Hey, yeah. sorry." <laughs> I was, I, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a little less aggressive, but it was like, yeah, like, yeah, I've spent three dollars on your movie, so I think you can take five minutes to read my story. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, and he yeah. did, he did. I'll be damned. <laughs> and that was, you know, that was also a different time because that was, you know, New Line, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street was their first big hit, right? So, you know, they were, you know, that was a moment in time too, where you know, Bob and, you know, Bob probably had time to read some kid from Kentucky's, you know, story. Um, so yeah, it was, a, you know, it's been a, it's been a very interesting career trajectory for sure. And a lot of that was, you know, obviously from stuff that I put out, you know, as far as like effort, but also the, the luck of the timing of it when, again, you could just email something that have a studio and they would read it. Yeah. How much of what you do is that? I mean, like, like so, so that, uh, you know, that black kid who lives in Kentucky, who's like, tells his mom, Hey, I'm going to be in the theater arts or I'm going to write TV shows. That's still an impossible sell for some kid out there. Like you're just trying to just try to get out of Kentucky, 
let's not try to, you know, conquer Hollywood or nothing. What, what does that look like well, today? It was, it was funny. I've, yeah, I've always, you know, my, my dream growing up was to be an actor because I loved, I just love movies so much. And, you know, mom would just be like, that's cute. Just get, you know, major in something with it and focus on something you can, you can actually get paid for and get a real job in. Cause you know, nobody, it, you know, and this is a thing that I hear people, especially if they live in kind of rural areas across America, they all have the same stories from their families where it's like, you know, you can never succeed in that, that business. So, you know, get a, okay. My cat is like going crazy in the window here. So pardon the flashing lights. Um, but yeah, like it's something like your family, you know, families just in general, I think it's probably because we don't teach arts, you know, as much as we use to in schools. And like, if a program is going to get cut, it's certainly the arts program because right. it's not seen as like a viable work yeah. um, to get into, but that's actually, it's actually a lot of, <laughs> it's a hell of a lot of work to get into. And, you know, you spend more, you do spend more time obviously struggling to make a steady income than you do in a, a set job where you, there's a track to start yeah. off here and then you keep advancing, but uh, it's definitely worth it. Um, if that's kind of like the only goal that you have in life or your only dream is to like, be a writer or actor or singer or director or something right. that's, you know, painter, you know, we, we can't go too much further without mentioning that you created the final destination franchise, which has given you, from my point of view, it's given you a lot of ability to, to do things in Hollywood that would be abnormal in terms of, you know, a writer coming up, you know, to, to be at this for, gosh, what is it? 20 years professionally now that you've been doing this to have yeah, that. Yeah. Let's say 20. <laughs> okay. Well, well, 15 or 10. It's or five. been long. It's yeah. been longer. It's been a long time. <laughs> no, it's been longer. Yeah. Okay. Longer. Well, right, cause you started as a kid, right? Yeah. I, I guess. So it is longer, but th that, yeah. that franchise tag, do you, has that been helpful or is it something where you're like, you know, I don't want to be known as that guy. No, you know what? It's, it, it certainly has been helpful. Um, and I, you know, I'm a big horror fan, you know, a very proud horror fan. So I don't mind that tag at all. Um, you know, I definitely want to create other things and hopefully, you know, it's certainly a dragon, you know, you, it's a high bar for somebody for their first film. So you're, you're definitely chasing that, you know, <laughs> you're definitely chasing that, that dragon, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, you know, the rest of your career my thing that I did, you know, I worked in, in New York. And since I kind of grew up inside the studio, when I sold the first one, I was like, oh, I can just stay here in New York and work and write on, you know, and just keep doing this. And then when I sold my story for the second Final Destination, they were like, you need to go out, you know, we love you, but it's time to go out and be a big boy <laughs> like writer. Um, <laughs> but I stopped to stay in New York. Like I didn't, when I sold the project at, in 97, I, you know, Adv career advisories would tell you like our advisors would say go out to los angeles and start work in the town um because that's the peak time to do it and i stayed in new york worked at new line cinema and didn't really come out to la and um, only came out to la after 9 11 so it was you know five four or five years after i sold the project and it was announced that i actually came out to hollywood to work the town and by the time i got out here they're like who the hell are you and i'm like uh, my name's all over the poster for Final Destination. But, <laughs> yeah. You know, the di director and his co-writer had lived out in L.A. And so when you're out here, it's like they put a face to the people that they see. So it was kind of a re-education, but it's definitely it's definitely helped. It's definitely helped. It's just when people say bring us something else like Final Destination, you know, and then they'll say, well, this one's too much like Final Destination. And this, it's like Goldilocks is porridge. It's like, right. this one isn't like Final Destination enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what they mean is they want that idea that is a different spin on something that's been done. You know, like there are no original ideas, but the execution of that was original. And that's all like kudos to, you know, New Line for taking a chance on it. Because they, they were like, we don't like this not showing death and not having, you know, a villain that you can see, like that doesn't, that's not how horror works. And also kudos to James Wong and Glenn Morgan when they came on for fighting to make sure that, that it stayed that way because it was a risk and studios don't take risks anymore. So it's like, well, if I brought you final destination today, you would pass on it. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's like, bring us something. And you're like, how about this something different? You know, it, not a horror film. Whoa. You know, and they're like, no, no, not, not yeah. that something. Bring us something else. You know, you're totally right. What, how has, so it's all comic book movies. It's all sequels. Why has Hollywood become so, uh, I don't know. I hate to put this in a negative term, so I'm just going to fail and do it. Why are they so locked in on something that's, I, mean, I remember what I, I used to want to see a sequel, right? Like as a kid, like, man, here comes Superman two. I was stoked for it. Right. Yeah. But now I'm like, Oh God, can't we just get a different story? You know, it's just, we're, what it's, happened? It's, I mean, it's pretty, I, you know, and I saw it happen when I worked at new line, it's a pretty basic thing. I mean, you know, it's show business. And when I worked at new line, like, you know, Bob Shea was a, is a movie lover. Like he loves movies and the creative side of it. Mike DeLuca, is a, who was, you know, working at New Line at the time, was a movie lover. And now you see a lot of business people have taken over the studios because they want to, you know, and so their decision process is all about risk mitigation. So for them, it's more, you know, when they do a sequel or a remake or do a movie based off a big book property, in their minds, it's like, well, there's an audience out there for it. So if we just redo it or if we adapt this book series then honestly their thinking is like, if it fails, it's not going to land on me, you know? Cause I'll be like, well, that was, the, you know, there were 10 million people that read that book, you know, it's not, you know, my fault that they didn't come see the movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And when you do see original stuff coming out of studios now, it's like Chris Nolan has to do like, you know, two or three Batman movies before he could do inception and then do tenant, you know, it's like he had to, continually prove himself at the safe blockbusters before the studio would give him the money to do something original. So the good news, the very good news is there's so many more outlets and production companies out there that you don't have to worry about trying to get directly to a studio. It's almost, honestly, it's almost impossible to get to a studio. Like most of the work now is, you know, you try to either get to a production company that puts out their own stuff or has a distribution deal you know, at a studio or you, you get with companies who have a first look deal at a studio um, instead of trying to go right to the studios. Cause it's like, it's just hard. It's even hard to get like any final destination going. I mean, you know, I'm very proud that we've had five sequels, but if you look in the, at the, you know, the horror landscape, like I think we're probably one of the only hit, hit franchises. that's only had five, <laughs> four sequels actually. <laughs> right. um, yeah. I think we're all, you know, we're like uh, five final destination five. Yeah. I am bad at math. I, you know, it's a COVID brain, it's, it's but, um, but you know, like, fr you know, Friday the 13th and Halloween and, you know, all the other big core franchises have had, have had like 15 sequels and reboots and, you know, reimaginings and prequels. And yeah, it's pretty funny. You don't have to answer this. So, so definitely feel free to bow it. But does, does the access to the find the franchise create, a lot of financial freedom where you can pick and choose what you want to do or are you have until like, I constantly have to do the same kind of things as Chris Nolan. Like I've got to go do these things to earn the right to do what I want to do one in four, one in five times. Oh no. I mean, yeah, no, I, I definitely, I mean, I, <laughs> I wish I was Chris Nolan. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I definitely have to continue, you know, because again, you, you know, people obviously have this assumption that, you know, Final Destination's made like, you know, over a billion dollars, I think, in box office and ancillary markets. And right. so they automatically think like, you know, I got a huge chunk of that. And that's not how Hollywood works, unfortunately. So people give me, a, people always talk about Final Destination and about how, yeah, in our rooms, we're always saying like, we want something like Final Destination. So it's great to meet with you and hear your ideas. And then you tell them the ideas. And again, they're, like I said, the they still want the same safe stuff. Like they don't, they're, they're not willing to take a chance on something that's original, which even new line, like we had to threaten the produce producers had to threaten to take it to Miramax, mm -hmm. you know, like new Line's competitor. They were like, if, if you pass on this, cause they didn't officially keep passing on it. They kept saying, well, we still have res you know, so they kept equivocating like why they weren't ready to pull the trigger and the producer's like, well, if you pass on it again, we're going to go to Miramax. And then New Line's like, we'll buy it. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's that thing where, again, they say they want something original. 
but they're scared of it because again, th- there are jobs on the line. Like if, if an executive green lights, something that's original and risky, and then it fails, they're going to get the blame. Yeah. And so business people don't like to, you know, they like to cover their assets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it does seem like, and, and this is again, not a knock on the big studios, but their game is to make those big blockbuster movies that bring in 10 X return on a massive budget. And, yeah. you know, they get that right once or twice, you know, in a year or two and, and everybody's happy and they're making money. So they really aren't that kind of, they're not interested in these other risks because they are already, you know, they're already doing something risky with, with, you know, putting all this money out. So I, I, I get that. And there's plenty of places that are in between that, yeah. that, that do these kinds of things. Is there a specific number of production houses that kind of focus on thrillers and horror as a genre? You know what I mean? Obviously, Blumhouse is, is the is the big one, but I know Sony has, you know, they've had a good track record in, in focusing on horror. And I know most of the studios are looking to get into it now more seriously because, um, you know, it's it's making a lot of money. So a lot of this, you know, a lot of the studios are are looking. Platinum Dunes was a production company, obviously, that did a lot of the you know, the remakes of like, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street and Texas Chainsaw and um, Friday the 13th. So there are companies that are doing that, but I think all, pretty much any production company is looking for a good horror movie. It's just, you know, now we're, now we're dealing with the, with COVID, which makes, you know, filming hard and Jeez. has pushed a lot of productions, you know, and it also, you know, a lot of people are suffering. Like, so the human suffering is obviously more important than making a movie, but you know, <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's, you know, but there's, you know, there's the people that are working to are not able to work right now because, you know, there's such restrictive measures, especially in Los Angeles to make films um, because there's just so many safety protocols and, yeah. you know, it's, a, it takes a lot of time. So I think that'll change, but, you know, even, I mean, the, the movie blockbusters don't, if they, if they, you know, like Deadpool, I forget what the budget on Deadpool was, but it, I think it was like 50 million or something, which mm-hmm. is way cheaper than 120 million or 200 million they spend yeah. on most of these. And it made a ton of money. Like it just goes to show you, like if you spend your money wisely, you can make a really good movie that makes a lot of money. But a lot of these superhero movies, especially are comic book adaptations, they have to get the rights and then, you know, they pay everybody top dollar, you know, like they get all the top everybody's working on it. And there's a lot of mid-level people that are just as good as the top level people. But if you're taking a risk on a movie, like why not hire the best to help cover your butt, you know? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you said, and um, I I don't know if you remember, we talked about this. I grew up with uh, another horror uh, writer and director, Todd Nunes, and he said the same thing. It's just the horror movies make money though. I mean, yeah. You're you're not going for a five star hit. You're going for and I'm not trying to undermine what you guys do, but you like of I, want, I want two and a half stars and I know this movie like it will draw our fan out. They don't want these elegant, you know, five star productions. Sure, you'd like to have a great movie, but there's a sweet spot for for this genre it seems like and it is profitable. Is it just that it's yeah. not profitable enough? Like they're like, "Yeah, we're going to make money, but we'd like to make a lot more." Or what is No, it? it's probably I mean, you know, the 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 movies that are hits make a lot of money. Like Happy Death they made over 100 million, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah. Insidious, like, you know, all those, you know, The Conjurings, you know, Get Out, like all these horror movies, you know, make a shit ton of money, especially, you know, when you compare it to what their bar, their uh, production costs were. Yeah. So they make money. It's just there's still this thing in Hollywood where it's like horror is just not as respected yeah. as other genres. Like, you know, I would say The Invisible Man was one of the best films to come out last year. Um, or this year, years are blending together, but, and I think that one actually could get some like Academy recognition, you know, because, you know, Elizabeth, the performances were great. The directing was great, but you know, the genre itself has just always been seen as like, you know, there there's, you know, porn and then there's horror, you know, as far as respectability in the business goes. And it's, it's been frustrating as a fan growing up in the business where it's like the studios gladly make them. And they, they talk about how 
they make money. You know, we don't yeah. need star. We just need a good story. But then, you know, when it comes to kind of rewarding great horror films, like they don't do it. You know, there's just a, a bar for horror that's set incredibly high. And even the ones that surpass the bar and are horror films that are better than dramas or comedies will just get overlooked. And uh, from talking to Mark um, Pellington, who you know yeah. directs, can we, he's like, I can't even get a thriller made at all. And I, I and I would love to hear your thoughts on the line between thriller and horror, like when they, you know, because a lot of times they blend. I think a lot of your stuff is kind of thriller esque, but also has the horror element to it. But he's like, you can't you can't make a thriller movie unless you pay for it yourself on Hollywood, and, and you know, no no one's doing that. What are your thoughts? Like, why does a whole genre like thriller go away? And then what is the distinction between the two? I mean. I have a very wide umbrella for horror, you know, so I consider like a really good thriller to be a horror movie as well. Any movie that like makes you scared and yeah. nervous and tense, you know, like, you know, Get Out was more of a thriller than a, you know, but I consider it a horror movie. But, if mm. you know, I'm sure, you know, if, if movie critics were breaking it down, they would probably call it a, a thriller. Right. But to Mark's point, probably the the, the thing is now what I've seen happen, which has changed so much over the years, which is again, totally ridiculous in my mind is, you know, we'll take a script to a studio and they're like, we love your script. What stars do you have attached? Yeah. And I'm like, Hey guys, when I used to work at new line cinema, I know it's been a while, but they would buy a script and then they would attach stars. Like yeah. that's your job. <laughs> like <laughs> they almost want you to yeah. bring them a director, a star and a script but then a star is not going to sign on to a script unless they know there, there's a studio that's backing it and going to put it out. So, you know, it's kind of it's it's like Hollywood's just made it even the studio system has made it even harder to get in, yeah. you know, because they want you to do all the work now. Which which makes me wonder, like in the podcast world, you know, we're we're, we're related. We're I don't know, maybe first cousin, second cousin, something like that. But you have to get to a certain point before they will take a shot at someone who doesn't need a shot anymore because they've reached a certain point. You know, like if I had a million yeah. people watching the show, I wouldn't have to get a meeting with Wondery. They would just come to me, you know, yes. but I wouldn't need them anymore. Like I don't need to share my audience with you. I've, I know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's the, you get, and that's the point is like when I'm talking to certain people, it's like, well, if, if I have a star, then I don't need you. Like I can just go to investors and get this finance. Like, you know, like Mark said, we can just finance it ourselves. If we, if you're going to make us go out and get a star, like, yeah, <laughs> like why do we don't need you anymore then? So it's, it's the business is kind of sorting itself out now. I think, um, I think because, because of the pandemic and because traditional, you know, a lot of traditional theatrical films have gone to, uh, VOD and probably made more money on VOD because they haven't had to spend all the sure. the distribution costs. I think that's going to make the business kind of reassess. I know they're already reassessing films. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean we won't get our our Avengers and our Wonder Woman's and our big you know action movies because again people are always going to want to see those. But kind of these really bloated um, budgets for things that don't need to be bloated. I think yeah. we're going to see a lot more people being fiscally responsible and and also taking chances on more stuff because that's the stuff that's going to stand out when people are sitting at home going through their their netflix yeah i mean if we're going to be positive about the industry i think we can say a couple things one um the stigma if there was anything left to it with you know straight to video or video on demand that that's all gone because that's there gone. are there are no major theatrical releases right now it's just not viable yeah. and who would have thought that was the case a year ago? We're like, yeah, no one's even going to go to theaters for the next year. Like, that's impossible. That's not possible. Yeah. What's what's Orville Redenbacher going to do when when he has to sell his popcorn? You know? <laughs> like, but, but here we are, you know. And you're like Hulu, the Obamas. Everybody's got a streaming platform they're putting together. Heck, President Trump right now, assuming he hasn't get a new job in about six months, he's considering starting a media outlet, not with the traditional been- studio. But doing yeah, all of this stuff. So it's gotten so small that like the market has kind of exploded and everybody's got their individual power. And, you know, it's it's like uh, it's like we're redoing a United Artists studio where like everybody can go out and create something. You, you get on a small yeah. budget and who wants a giant. You can't have a giant crew right now. It's it's impossible to pull off. Yeah. I mean, 
it would be so expensive to make something that was COVID safe. And then even then, I mean, just the protocol to manage the protocol to get a movie like yeah. that made, it's just impossible. So it, it is a good time in terms of the opportunities are wide open. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and, and I think what people are realizing now is there is a, you know, cause there are so many, you know, billions of people on the planet that there's, you know, there's a way to reach these people now without having to, to go the theatrical route. It's like, you can tap into your, to your market with your, you know, private channels, you know, something will become a viral YouTube hit and get made into a movie or something will, you know, a short will like become a sensation online and get made into a feature. Um, so there's a lot more opportunities for people to create their own content and get it out there, which is great. And you, you're absolutely right. You have A-list stars now that are doing, you know, HBO series or AMC series or TNT series. So this whole idea that doing TV is like a step down from having a theatrical release or having a video, straight to video release is like gone now because you have major stars doing it. It's, it's just a funny business. It's, it's, um, it just cracks me up how I love how it works, but it, from a business perspective, it's always frustrating when it's like, you feel like, you know, the studio system's like 10 years behind the rest of the country, even though they're trying to be so forward thinking, it's like, you know, there's no shame in doing a, 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 a cable movie or a TV movie. If it's a great movie, you know, um, you know, there is something obviously like, you know, there's an inherent kind of ego boost if your movie comes out in theaters and you can go see it with a crowd. Um, and that's why I think the theater experience is never going to die. I know people are kind of, you know, planning its funeral, like drive-ins are going to go, our theaters are going to go away. They're never going to go away. Like yeah. we always, you know, we're communal s social people yeah. and, you know, we love to go sit in a theater and scream or laugh and cry with a bunch of people. Like, it's just, there's nothing, that feeling's amazing. So um, it may take a while to get back to that place, but yeah. we will we will be at that place again. I took my uh, nieces, two two nieces and my daughter, and they were all you know like uh, middle school, early high school age, and I, I took them to go see the the uh, purge, and we yeah. saw it in a, in a black theater, and yeah, they had never experienced this before. You know, and it's like, no, no, this is interactive theater here, but this is not just yeah. shut up and watch a movie. Like, and it was great <laughs> because I'm like, this is so much fun. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it was just wonderful. And they had never experienced that once they had seen it. And I'm like, you have to understand, like, if you go to this part of town and you watch this kind of a movie, this is what you're like, this is the experience you're getting free entertainment. You just have to go yeah. along for the ride and then go see the movie later on. But you're right. Like it's so it's so much fun to go see a great a thriller, especially where the whole crowd is reacting and it just we all feed on each other. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's fantastic. I love that. I wanted uh, let's let's talk about your movie though. I mean, we've been chatting about the industry. Let's get specifically into what you're working on now. Now you've got several projects in the pipe, but let's just let's start with uh, Don't Look Back because I was watching the trailer and I watched a good bit of it on Vimeo from you. Thanks for the uh, trailer or the um, access, by the way. Of um, course. You know, classic, classic, you know, I would call it a ghost story. What do you call it? It's a, I would call it, um, because we're not sure it's, it becomes a, it's, I, I would call it a mystery thriller with okay. some, with some horror, ele horror supernatural elements because, um, you don't, the, the kind of mystery of the movie is, you know, it's, it's about a group of people who see somebody getting assaulted in a park and, for various reasons don't help, like don't even call the police and, until it's too late. And the person dies and the witnesses who were there get out to the public and then something or somebody starts coming after them. So the lead character is kind of trying to solve the mystery of the murder in the park, but she's seeing things and, you know, she's kind of a spiritual woman. And so she's seeing things that lead her to believe that his ghost maybe is haunting them, but you're not sure if it's his ghost. You're not sure if it's karma. You're not sure if there's a killer out there and she's just imagining this. So that's the kind of key to that's the driving force of the movie. So it is funny because as much as I love horror, like I did pick a very, I picked a job. I picked the type of movie that they tell you not to pick when you're <laughs> first directing something, which is, you know, it's basically a mystery thriller and potential supernatural horror movie. And you don't know what it is until everything comes together at the end. So um, I'm very happy with how it turned out. I think, you know, the people, that it's it's been funny watching the the critic reactions because 
the critics that haven't liked it have gone in expecting Final Destination. So they're like, well, Jeffrey should know that for a good horror movie, you need to have big bloody set pieces with like, you know, this and this and this. And I'm like, yeah, this isn't Final Destination. Like, there's a reason I can't show like big bloody set pieces because we don't know who or what the killer is. Right. Um, so it's a mystery until the end. And the people that have actually really like, it's definitely like, which is great. You know, I think people have a strong reaction one way or other. There are people that really don't like it because they just don't think it's horror enough in the traditional horror sense. And the people that do like it really like it because they get all the other kind of stuff that I was trying to say with this about, you know, just how society, you know, we've become an age where like, if we see something horrible happen, we pull out our phones and we record it. Like back in the old days, it's like dial 911, you know, and then you can record it if you want, but yeah. people skip over the 911 part and just go right to recording. And I think that speaks to like a real problem that we have in society right now with apathy and, and um, you know, and also with this film, you know, faith is a strong element of it. Like the lead character is, is, you know, without, you know, pounding it over the head, she's a Christian woman of faith which is, which is interestingly has rubbed some horror viewers the wrong way. Um, and, you know, but the movie deals with guilt and faith and, you know, karma and, a you know, apathy and, you know, it deals with a lot. <laughs> I crammed a lot into a short movie, but, but I wanted to, you know, deal with those kind of themes in my first film direct, you know, for my first time directing. Yeah, I saw that you were uh, directing. I didn't realize it was your directorial debut for you. Congratulations. I, I just assumed you had already directed. Uh, I mean, you've done so many things. So No, I, I directed a short, okay. and I directed a, a, music, a friend's music video, but this is my first time directing a feature. So it was um, it was really exciting, and you, you you learn a lot. You know, you get a – if you've been – because I've been very fortunate to be on most of the sets of the films that I've done – you know, you watch other directors and you're on set and you do a short and you're like, oh, I know, I know, I know how this is going to play. But until you're actually directing a feature, um, you don't realize all the stuff you don't know until you're actually on set. So I, I learned so much that now I'm very ready to kind of do my next one, you know, when it comes along. I had a, a couple of very young uh filmmakers they've made a feature film which already as you know is impossible to do but they are yeah. just so so young you know and and film school and all that like the the director kept saying and this is not in any way a knock i'm just trying to draw a parallel he kept saying i learned this in film school i learned this in film school and i kept covering my kept, stop saying that just say i know this you know like yeah. ma master it and everything but but yet they pulled off this movie and and i mean Look, you can get in there with the critics comb and complain about it, but I look at it as being you've created a piece of art no matter what. This is a movie. It's viable. It got bought by Indican. So, it, it, you yeah. know, they did it. But they are so, so young. Yeah. How, how do you compare your journey to get to this point and direct? Because you're right. Like your first time, you can see it and do it. But until you put your hands on it, you don't know it. But is is there how does someone so young and precocious do this and someone so seasoned do it differently and and, and you know, I don't know. Just talk you know, about I that. always, yeah, I always tell people, you know, cause I speak to a lot of classes and a lot of students and I, and I always tell them like, you know, the passion and the fearlessness that you have now, you will not, it'll start going away as you get older. And a lot of it's because this business will chip away at you and break you down. You know, it just will. It's a tough business once you get into the business part of it. But when you're young, you know, like when I was growing up, we didn't have access to like 4K cameras on our iPhones. Right. You know, we had to bring out, you know, get out the old clunky. You know, we, we were happy when you could record it. When we got the cameras where you could record on VHS, you yeah. know. It's like, yeah, it's so, you know, young people today have access to so much. And I remember I was judging um, the horror competition for, and I'm blanking on the school here, but it was a high school here in Los Angeles. And I went there and like several of the students couldn't be there because they were in can. <laughs> right. cracked me up. Wow. <laughs> and I remember the winners of the competition, um, and I have their names somewhere, but um they won the they won the film competition for a film that they did, but the best film that I saw was still from them and it won the audience award. And it was the film because they had finished shooting their movie on like Saturday. And they're like, well, we still have our equipment till Monday, so we might as well just do something else. And so they just came up with an idea, wow. hired some neighbors and shot it. And it was the best film of the competition. And it was because they had that passion and that like, 
let's just get something done. And that's how, that's how you, especially when you're younger, that's, that's the energy that you have is like, let's just do this and let's just make this. Yeah. They have the resources to do it now. So, you know, my advice is always like, you know, I talked to Craig Perry at a, at a, uh, at USC or yeah, USC here, you know, he asked the class, he's like, okay, you know, how many of you directors, um, raise your hand and the directors raise their hand and writers raise your hand. And then he said, now, how many of you all are friends? And none of them were friends. All the directors were friends with other directors. All the writers were friends with other writers. And he's like, that's the problem. Like you're a director, you need scripts. You should be friends with, you should be making friends with the writers, actors. You should be making friends with the writers and directors. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so it sounds like these filmmakers, you know, that you're talking about, like they found a, a group of people. And that's what I tell people find like a posse that's diverse that, you know, has actors, writers, directors in it. Make sure you kind of cut the toxic people out because, you know, a lot of this, you know, a lot of of any industry, you know, people who succeed can often be like people who talk a big game but don't deliver anything. <laughs> so it's yeah. like find a good posse that's like, you know, down to earth, creative, passionate, honest and s- surround yourself with those people and make stuff like you don't need to, you know. Because if you make something, it will get picked up by somebody. It'll, it will draw an audience. Yeah, I saw, uh, I think it's called Get Duked. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. It, and it's it's great. And one of the things I like about it, and this kind of goes to your whole, like we all have access to wonderful production tools. You don't have to have, I'm, I'm going to say this carefully here, you don't have to have special effects. Like they don't have to be perfect and real. You can have a digital just straight up effect. Nothing terribly special yeah. about it. Because we've all learned to kind of suspend that part of belief. Like, yeah, we know this is not a multi hundred million dollar budget movie. Yeah. The fire is going to look a little digitalized, you know, or the car. Yeah. Like, it's we've we've gotten to this point, and now imagine ten years from now how good these regular effects will be. They really might be I truly know. special grade. Where you're like, oh my god, high school kids be, you know, like think about Blair Witch, whatever that movie's going to be, fifteen years from now, and what they'll be able to pull off just in post on their own for, you know, a couple hundred dollars in software. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's, you know, I'm friends with Dan, Dan Myrick, you know, and, and, and Eduardo who did Blair Witch. And it's like, again, that was, you know, they were young brassy film students who came up with this great idea. And then they found a distributor who came up with a brilliant marketing campaign and the, you know, the rest is history with them. You know, it's like, but that's the thing is like, you know, I'm, I was, I still get really passionate about stuff, but I can't help but think business outcomes. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like I think the last script that I wrote just for fun was Tamra. Yeah. And that was when I got so sick of everybody telling me to like come up with another funnel destination. I'm like, fuck it. I just, I'm going to write a fun movie that has everything in it that I, I, I want. And then I wrote Tamra. Um, and it did, it did get watered down. Like originally, you know, it was going to be set up at Lionsgate for like $5 million and we ended up doing it for way, way less and shooting it in Winnipeg, um, for way, way less money. So there's a lot of stuff that got cut out of it, but it's still one of my favorite movies because it just, I wrote it for fun, like in, and I had a great time writing and I still have fun writing, but you know, there's always this pressure when you're writing, especially, you know as you get older and you're working in the business, it's like, okay, I want to write something, but I want to write it to sell. Mm. Like I, you know, I need to sell this. So how do I, you know, merge the creative with the commerce of the business? Um, And when you're younger, you're just like, I have a great story. I want to tell like, that's the 14 year old kid that wrote Bob Shea. Yeah. Like I, this, I put my heart and soul in this story and I want you to read it. (laughs) Damn it. Damn it. Uh, yeah, you know, this is, cur- I'm curious too, because I'm going to go back to the movie now, you know, like they talk about, if you see something, say something. And now it's, if you see something, try to go viral with that shit, you know? And Oh and, yeah, that's what, <laughs> yeah. And have, you, that's, yeah. Have we lost control or lost a sense for what a hero in real life really is? Have we just forgotten that, you know, like you don't have to have a fire coat or a badge on to be a hero. You can really be someone's mom and, or dad and, you know, go and, you know, do something about something. And I'm not saying making a vigilante vigilante out of a mom. Oh, yeah. but- no, no. And I, I've said the same thing. It's like, that's kind of the undercurrent of the problem now is people are more, it's not everybody, but people are more interested because we're getting conditioned to it now because they see people getting on the news 
you know, people are more interested. A lot of people are more interested in viral fame than they are in helping people. And it's like, again, if you're going to pull out your phone, call the police first. Like I see so many recordings where people are recording something violent happening. And they're like, well, maybe we should call the police now. I'm like, no shit. You should call the police. You should have called the police before you started filming this. Yeah. Um, so I think that again, society has just, we're, we're going down a really dark road of where we, we've just lost empathy for each other. And I think, I think it's grown more, it's grown more over the last four years for, for sure. You know, the divisiveness and the, cameras recording stuff and people not wanting to listen to people or people not wanting to have people near them that don't think like them. And, and we can't live in a world like that. You know, there's only so much space on this, on this planet and, you know, we're one country and it's like, we, you know, we can't start segregating people who don't think or look or act like us. Like that's not what the, that's not how the world works. Um, so yes, yeah, something is simple a simple act of kindness can go a long way. And then, yes, if you see something weird and you call the police, then you can be a hero without putting your life in danger. So it's, 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 it was something I definitely wanted to speak to yeah. with the movie because it's just, you know, people are like, Oh, this is so timely. I'm like, you know what? I wrote this a while ago. <laughs> it it uh, took a long time to get this movie made. So it's sadly <laughs> always been timely, but yeah. hopefully it, it won't be more timely. Hopefully in five years, it'll be like, Oh, that's a thing of the past. What a relic of the past. Yeah. You know, you and I are basically the same age. I mean, we're born just a few months apart. And I remember a time when we were trying to, like, you know, r really go MLK, like judge a person on their character, you know, and not, not yeah. on how they look. And when I saw Jojo Rabbit, I saw a an indictment of both political sides where everybody is trying to identify somebody else before the person even gets to be anything, you know, you're this, yeah. you're that. I've been called every name in the book. I, I I have the ability to make both sides mad at me, you know? <laughs> so yeah. I, which I, I guess I kind of pride myself in. But when I saw Jojo Rabbit, and I'm like, yeah, this stuff that you guys are doing using Jewish, you know, caricatures <laughs> from the Nazi point of view, everybody is doing this to everybody. We got to stop yeah. this assassination of each other's you know, like not even having a chance to be a good person. Like you can literally disagree and both of you can be fantastic, wonderful people that want roughly yeah. the same outcomes. You just disagree on the means. I mean, if we can't get well, along with that jinkies. Well, you know, and I, and I, and I do, I do blame our, a lot of our leaders for that. And I think the two party system has, has a lot to do with that because they only stay in power if they have an enemy, you know, yeah. and, and that's, you know, that's both political parties um, that do that. Um, neither one can claim that they're better than the other one. You know, right. like, you know, neither one can take the moral or religious high road and say, well, we're better right. than the other side. Because they that's how they stay in pow power. I think, you know, they realize, like, if there was ever a, a true rise of, like, an independent, like, people's party, you know, then their power's over. Like, all those lobbyists and all that shit, all that stuff goes, is for naught. Right. So. That's yeah. why it's going to, it's going to take a, it's going to take a general population kind of realizing that they're being played to hate other people and see through the tactics, which are for me, clearly obvious. Like I'm sitting here just going, you know, every time I see s certain politicians of either party speak, you know, I'm like, you're just, all you're doing is just playing into the stereotype and all you're doing is like stirring up fear in your people and disdain for other people and there's a simple way that you can have a general conversation like i have like friends that are like ultra right-wing evangelicals i have friends that are like ultra left-wing atheists and we get on the phone and we have conversations and they're like well i wish everybody would talk like you yes. and i said but yeah you need to talk to other people you need to talk to other people like you're talking to me and not just get whipped up when your leaders tell you you know, give you a talking point. Like yeah. once you start talking and talking points and you're not talking an actual discussion, then you're in trouble, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. The other thing is, is if you're that whipped up in something, find something else to get whipped up about, you know, go yes. create something. I want to, so editorially, as you try to decide what you're doing and I, you know, like I understand Hilliard's writing process. He's kind of like a conveyor belt. He's like, now I'm working on this. Now I'm working on that, you know, and that he's just Damn always, him. 
I wish I was like that. Well, yeah, right. And I saw one of the things you were talking about, kind of your pace. You're more, um, I guess you would say more artistic. Like, this is when I can write. Now, if you have to work, you work. But, you know, when you're writing your own stuff. Editorially, though, how do you sort out, like, I need to write something you know, in, in fill this bucket and fill that bucket. And I want to go fill that bucket, but I'm not able to right now because I got to get, how do you sort all that stuff out when you're creative? Um, it honestly, it's usually with the work that's coming in okay. and the deadlines that I have, <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, I had a, you know, and I, I try not to do this, um, often, but you know, I had a, I had a script that I was supposed to turn in today and I, I called the showrunners and I was like, Hey, how hard of a deadline is today? Or um, yesterday I called them and they're like, yeah. well, actually, if you got it to us Monday, that would help us because we've got a lot of stuff on our plates. So I'm like, yay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah. that gives me a chance to, you know, but a lot of my work is based just upon the work that I have now. Like, mm. um, I mean, I, I am like Hilliard in that, you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff at the same time because I'll be pitching for this project. I'm up for this project. So I have to have a pitch for that. I'm rewriting this. I've working on this show, you know, I still have my horror scripts, you know, that haven't been picked up that I'm still trying to hustle. So I'm doing a lot at the same time, but I, I focus my writing on what's in front of me. Like, cause you know, like right now it's like, you know, I've had this major like debate the last couple of years, like what, what new thing do I want to write? Cause yeah. I have so much work stuff set up that I, you know, at some point I, I want to write a new script and, you know, and I've kind of settled on the fact that I want to write a gay horror movie. Like it's just, there hasn't been one. Um, I shouldn't say there hasn't been one. There hasn't, <laughs> there have been some, but there, you know, I want to write one. Um, and at first I put the pressure on myself that it has to be some kind of high brow take, like get out, you know, on yeah. the gay experience. But one of my friends was like, dude, just, just write it. Cause I was like, you know, I got to come up with something high brow. You know, I don't just want to write a bunch of, you know, gay and lesbian, like, you know, trans, like camp counselors getting killed by a mass killer. He's like, just write that. We'll take anything, <laughs> you know, like we, we don't have representation in the genre, like just write anything. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, but I'm, I'm going to approach that once I get into it by making it, I want to make it fun. Like, you know, I want to have fun writing it. So, but it's like, when am I going to get the time to do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, right. And then that's why I'm asking this question of you, because you've got to pay the bills. You've got yeah. to flex your artistic muscle. I think, I guess with this movie, you would have to at least think through like your social responsibility. I mean, do you just make graduation day with an all gay cast, you know, or is it, you know, do you have to bring in some kind of message or I don't, you know, I mean, like, I'm not telling you what I you have it. to yeah, I mean, you know, I did I did a message movie. I feel like with Good Samaritan, uh, or okay. Don't Look Back. Good Samaritan was the original title. Um, I feel like I already did my message. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think message movies can be important. It's it's funny when you mentioned MLK before because I always say like, you know, you need your Martin Luther Kings, but you also need your Malcolm X's. Yep. And I think in movies, you know, having stories that speak specifically to the experience of the audience that you're writing for is important. I also think representation is just as important mm -hmm. because usually we're all telling human stories anyway. Like, you know, so if, you know, like with, with Don't Look Back, I mean, we have a, a beautiful, great black lead in the movie and that automatically set, is saying something because you don't see you know, black female leads in a, in a lot of genre films. Um, and that gives it a different angle, perhaps when audiences are viewing the story, you know, they, they can add some extra context onto that, but sometimes just having, you know, I, I there's a slasher movie that I wrote that's very scream. Like, I, I think, I don't know if we talked about it on the last show or not, mm -hmm. but you know, the way I describe it is it's like, it's a great slasher movie, but instead of focusing on all the pretty white college students in their, one black and brown friend, you know, we yeah. just, we just move the camera over to all the pretty black and brown students yeah. and they're one or two white friends. Yeah. Like, so I think sometimes representation is just as important sure. um, a, as having a message. And I think representation in and of itself is a message because especially if the movie's successful, you're just letting Hollywood know, Hey, you know, these people, you know, because the thing is like, it's great to go see a movie where somebody looks like you, 
like that's the thing you know with hollywood is when i'm explaining diversity and casting which honestly was not a thing until recently um you know the the whole conversation is really that the default for casting directors is white when they're yeah. casting lead roles yeah. it's that's just automatically what they send you is yeah. all white people so it's nothing to do with like we found the best person for the job it's like well but you only looked at one pool of, of talent right. like yeah. even when we've sent out casting director notices saying open to all ethnicities 99 percent of the submissions we get are white actresses and actors so then we have to go out and say, looking for Latino, looking for Asian, looking for black, you know, we have to specifically looking for Muslim. We have to specifically say we're looking for a, before that. And then they'll still throw white actors in there too. Well, are you sure you don't want to look at this person? So that's kind of the battle that, that actors and actresses of color have are facing Hollywood is just, they're not thought of as lead, you know, unless you're Halle Berry or Denzel Washington, you know, or Will Smith, you're not thought of as a lead at as right. a lead actor or lead character in a, in a movie. So, you it know, does, hopefully that changes. It does seem like we're getting better at this though. And and, yeah, and by that, are. I mean, we're making a terrible mess of it. You know, like you, <laughs> when you see, um, I don't know, just like when the reward shows are trying to correct, they're going to overcorrect. And you're gonna be like, come on, like, let's just like, let's find the best movie. Like I saw Parasite and I thought, you know, it's okay. You know, I, I'm not sure why it won. And, and if it's going to be a social kind of thing, great. Okay let's sort it out but at some point we have to correct this and and uh, like my daughter and i like to play a game like recast the movie you know with modern right. characters and everything and i, I know that i have a uh, um you know just because culturally i'm a white dude and so i cast with the white people in my mind and then so we'll kind of go through an initial push get everybody casted and then i'm like okay now let's get uncomfortable and let's find a, a character who's whatever transgendered or gay or whatever it is let's let's you know completely flip this relationship by making this other character something else but it's a lens i have to put in front of how i initially think of it which is i, I think right. how it works with humans and, and race and bigotry it's like yeah of course we're all bigots but it's that slowing down and saying now how do i make this more you know inclusive without making it yeah. hokey inclusive you know yeah <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing, is like, you know, pendulums tend to swing hard in society, right? Um, especially when they're course correcting it, you know, it's it's happened with, you know, women's rights and civil rights, like there's usually a hard shift of the pendulum. And then there's always a backlash. And then you end up somewhere in the middle of right. stuff. Um, so, you know, there's been a, there's been a hard shift in a, in a good way, I feel, but you know, it's, it's, because I'm always coming from a place of like educating or, or bringing people together for sure. the long term. And I know a lot of people that, um, you know, like I, I, I think, you know, this course correction has made a certainly straight white men feel uncomfortable in the business. You know, like I hear them complaining all the time, like, Oh, now I can't get work. And it's like, well, now you know how I felt for 20, <laughs> 25, 30 years, yeah. but this is only going to last for a short time. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's not true. They they obviously can still get work. It's just like when 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 you're used to kind of being like people's first choice, like you said, when you have that lens on, when you're mm -hmm. used to being the first person called in for a leading role, and now all of a sudden they're bringing people that normally are overlooked, you're going to feel like it's a slight against you. But yeah. it's not a slight against you. It's just like a correction that the business is making. So you know they're they're settling into it but it's funny even after black panther came out i'm like that is the blackest movie i've ever seen in my life like from like the sounds track to the accents to the locations to the costumes and that movie blew away most of marvel's superhero movies and when you point that out and say see people don't care like if you make a good movie it that speaks to people they don't care if people have costumes that they're not accustomed to or speaking in a dialect they're not like they don't care they want good movies and then people will go yeah but that was a marvel movie so that's different like you still hear that in hollywood mm -hmm. um and it gets so frustrating and it's like get out you know yeah well there were still, that, there were still mostly white people in that movie it's like okay fine it's yeah. like yeah, I, <laughs> my complaint about that movie because i i didn't really land for me it was good i'm not but i wasn't blown away yeah. by it but it was uh, it was early on, and it was just a simple thing. You know, I grew up in the Bay. I've been to Oakland. I've played basketball there. And when they showed those kids playing basketball, that wasn't Oakland. 
like they concocted some kind of New York version of Oak. And, and you know what I'm saying? Right. Like it wasn't like that is not what Oakland looks like. And so if you're from that area, you're like that, that you're show. they really, they, they did as they showed us New York and said it was open. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and I was like, it's so simple to get that right. How, did, how in the world do they miss that? You know, here is this legit movie that's going to make a lot of money and no one cares about this detail, but it's sim- such a simple thing to get right. Well, it's probably, it, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't speak for that, but it's probably because you see that in a lot of movies where it's like, you know, like people from Louisiana know that we shot our movie in Louisiana. Right. I never say where it takes place on purpose because I'm like, I'm not going to try to pretend it's some other, right. Some other city. But yeah, when they're working on big budget things like that, it's like, well, we'll just, you know, they look at pictures and then they just try to recreate something, you know? Yeah wherever they're shooting because yeah. you know they're like well we don't we can't afford to fly a crew and cast down to oakland just to shoot you know these kids in this one scene <laughs> right right yeah um, yeah I, and, and, and you know the movie did great they didn't need my help and my approval or anything so they did, <laughs> they did just fine but it is funny how those little things can can nest in there and you're just like i couldn't let it go and i'm like let's let it go pete but i couldn't I was so <laughs> aggravated by that. It You're took, like, you don't understand. Yeah, they don't understand yeah, Oakland. Oakland. <laughs> yeah. My mom drove by a Black Panther protest once. <laughs> 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 so I don't want to take too much of your time. But seriously, man, we shouldn't take years in between uh, doing these things. Anytime you're working on something, and I can look in your IMDb, you're working on stuff. Uh, do you want to <laughs> yeah. talk about any of your upcoming projects at all, or is it all sort of pre talk about stage. no i can there's a couple of things i can talk about i mean obviously you know don't look back is is out now on itunes and amazon and voodoo and all the all the streaming services so um you know definitely if you get a chance i'd love people to check that out yeah um i also produced a movie called the call that timothy woodard jr who directed the final wish um a couple of years ago directed um it has a lynn shea in it again we reteamed it with lynn shea but also paired her with tobin bell which is super exciting. It's their first movie together. And that came out in theaters um, and is now on VOD too. (laughs) So, um, and it did really well in theaters, like especially because of the COVID, you know, thing. It it was like in the top five for a long time at at theaters. Um, And it's a really fun, like if you want a straight up horror movie, like the, you know, the call is your straight up horror movie. And then your don't look back as the kind of mystery thriller that you can watch with your friends who who are normally too scared to watch a horror movie or don't like horror movies, they can watch that one, but it's a good double bill. Um, I'm working on two animated YA series for Netflix, which is fun. One they've announced so I can talk about it, but it's the, it's a spinoff of the Usagi Yojimbo Japanese comic book. Right. And um, it's been so much fun writing in that world. Um, It's just been a lot of fun. (laughs) We still get to kill people, but it's only in silhouette and you can't kill them much. <laughs> you can't show much. Gotta be real gentle with it, it can't be a lot of killing, <laughs> only a little bit. I love it. And then, yeah, there, I mean, the other things that I have going on are potentially going on. We're just waiting for deals to happen and things. So yeah. um, I like, as always, I just tell people to follow me on Twitter. Okay. Yeah. I just tell them to follow me on Twitter because I always make announcements, you, you know, about what I have going on on Twitter. Right, right. Um, what's your Twitter handle? Oh, Jeffrey A. Reddick, J E F F R E Y A. Reddick. Oh, you know how to spell my name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Barely. I have to always but, make um, sure I get it right. <laughs> yeah, but that's the best way to kind of keep up with me. I've, I, I don't post that much on Instagram because, you know, I'm just writing all the time. So it's like, that's not too exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to probably post more cat pictures on there. And, uh, <laughs> And maybe if this working out a little bit in Cato diet pays off, maybe I'll post a shirtless picture someday. We'll nice, see. The but you know, that's what you have to post on Instagram. That's all they care yeah. about is get that shirt off. <laughs> um, so Twitter is the best way to stay, stay up with what I'm doing. Okay. And, um, but yeah, like I'm really, I am really proud of don't look back. And, and um, again, we've gotten some, you know, really positive responses. So, you know, I just, I hope people will check that out. And if they like it, kind of spread the word because it's, um, it's a special film for me. It's, you know, my first one, you know, so it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's real. I'm proud of it. I'm really proud of it. I've, uh, I've decided that I'm not going to complain about, um, lower budget movies, I guess. I don't, I don't know what the nice term is because there's nothing wrong with making a movie for any Mm -hmm. amount of money, 
But um, indie movies. <laughs> what is it? B, you said? No, indie movies. Oh, indie. Okay. How about this? Yeah. Okay. So I am not going to be as critical of indie movies because you guys are doing incredible things. And I can't complain about the, you know, this shot or that shot thing. If I want to still complain about all of the ridiculous superhero movies and see, you know, forever, like ah, just so many spinoffs and everything else. Like I want the original ideas. That's the indie market. And I've become really comfortable with how the movies look, you know, and, and I, I think it's great. The other thing I want to say is you think about how many times I'm talking mostly to the audience here. You might have gone to a theater in the past, you know, maybe it's five times a year, once a month, twice, whatever it is. Do that with video on demand. Just have a night with your friends, throw a projection on the wall or whatever it is, make some cookies, invite some people over, spend five bucks, and then just put some money back in, in pockets for people like Jeffrey to make wonderful things because here he is writing his heart out and working hard to bring us things. Whether it's Don't Look Back or, you know, whatever the next Final Destination, spend some money on these movies because this these indie folks... They make, they, there are some wonderful stories and like, it's not just, I, I, I've had a bunch of um, international films come on, but these aren't foreign films from the olden days where you're like, what in the hell did I just watch? These are just straight up good stories, you know, and I, I love it, man. I love being able to explore this universe with people like you and pick your brain. I just, again, I, I think the world of you and thank you so much for coming on, Jeff. Of course. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. And yeah, let's not make this a, uh, a, uh, couple of year thing like i don't yeah what episode am i now Eight, uh, 800 800 and something i can't i've got to look yeah it's a yeah about to get that's, to that's a lot that's a lot of that's a lot of in between episodes so yeah. you got to fix that yeah <laughs> steady you have too many projects we got to talk about them